Uh, my name is Laura May Isaacman, and um, I am here today talking about publishing short stories and writing the kinds of short stories that get published. Uh, to give you a little bit of an idea about my background, um, I've been editing fiction since 2009. Uh, my very first literary magazine was an online magazine called Four Paper Letters. And from there, about two years later, I moved into print um, with my first print magazine called The Coffin Factory. And about two years after that, I did my second print magazine called Tweed's Magazine of Literature and Art. And now I run a book editing company out of Brooklyn. Um, before I really begin, um, I just want to take a moment to thank Reedsy uh, for this opportunity. This short story course is actually a kickoff of something that I did about a month or so ago with Reedsy. Um, and that was one of their Reedsy learning courses. Uh, mine particularly was called How to Craft a Killer Short Story. And it's it's a little different from today because today I'll, um, I have fewer topics when I go a little bit more in depth. But with the Reedsy learning course, it sort of shows you how to construct a story from the very first point of um, sort of thinking about a story all the way through publishing it, how to publish it, um, how to find literary magazines, um, and how to start your writing career. Um, so definitely sign up for that if you're interested in learning more about short stories. Uh, Reedsy Learning has a ton of, sh of, of different courses on all different kinds of things on writing, publishing, and marketing, anywhere from cookbooks to children's books. Um, so whatever else you're interested in, aside from short stories, I definitely recommend you check it out. It's basically 10 lessons over the course of 10 days. Um, they're sent to your email. They're really good nuggets. They take about five minutes each to read, um, and uh, you can keep revisiting them. So head over to readsy.com slash learning and check them out. Four sections that I've sort of broken down today's lesson into. Um, one is uncovering uh, the heart of your story. That sort of plays into structure, which some of you had said that you were um, wondering about. Um, the second is building characters, which is my absolute favorite part, um, and I think it can be the trickiest, so I'm really looking forward to talking about that. Uh, the third part is editing, um, which is how to edit down your short story, um, how to put only the most crucial elements in your short story, um, and how to make a really punchy and effective short story. Um, and sort of how to recognize um, where and how to edit your work. And then the fourth, of course, is submission. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the differences between online magazines and print magazines. And depending on what you're looking for out of your writing career, which one might be more appropriate for you. Um, I will stop for questions after every section. So if, as I'm talking, you're thinking of something, um, please put it in the comments. We'll try and get to it. Um, and like I said, if there's anything else beyond that, you can feel free to, free to reach out to me after. Okay, so what makes a good short story? Well, a couple of things. One is that it's got to stay true to your unique voice and perspective, right? We have to think about writing as an art. It's an art form. And the way that you are going to create the best art is to stay true to your unique vision, voice, and experience. It's not by imitating somebody else. It's not by trying to do what you think um, big magazines, big literary magazines are doing. You're not going to fail. Yes, it can be a great writing exercise to, um, to sort of emulate the style of one of your favorite writers and to see if what about your writing matches theirs and where you're able to do what they're doing and where you're where you fall short great writing exercise not actually useful for creating super short stories that are going to be effective and that are going to resonate with readers right because a good short story is not only told in your voice from your perspective but it also really deals with sort of this emotional base that all humans um, have you know, good short stories are not just about a simple plot on the surface of the story. Every good short story has layers of emotion underneath. Um, things that you as the writer are trying to work through. Um, and this could be as dramatic as past traumas in your life. 
Um, and it could be as simple as sort of things that bring you joy. Um, it could be about sort of uncovering parenting if you're a new parent, parent and sort of what that means and the difference between, you know, your new life and your old life. Um, it has to be things that are emotionally true to you. Um, we've all had similar experiences. And what I mean by that is that we've all, all experienced similar emotions, uh, anger, loss, grief, joy, confusion, stress, right? All of those things are universal to all of us, even though they come out in different forms. So that it has to be the core of your short story for two reasons. One, you're going to write a better short story, right? Because it's the old write what you know, which I'll get to in a minute. And two, if you've now written a better short story, that means that the reader is going to identify with that short story because they're going to see themselves there on the page. So if you're writing a short story that's about a character that's dealing with um, loss, right, and he's a grieving character, well, we've all dealt with that. So whatever your experience is, if you are honest and you put it on the page, then I'm going, as the reader, I'm going to say, oh, I, I've, I've had that. I've dealt with that grief. I, I know what that writer is talking about. I'm going to immediately connect with the story, and I'm going to keep reading it, right? That's good writing. Um, so the most important thing is really you have to write what you know um, so that it translates to the reader. Uh, just a quick note on writing what you know. Um, I think a lot of people are confused with writing what you know and what that means. Um, it does not mean that if you're an editor, like myself, that I'm going to write a story about being an editor. Not at all. It's exactly what I was just talking about. Writing what you know is writing about what you know emotionally um, and writing from your experience. It's never surface level experience. It's always writing about if you've ever had a breakup and it's made you sad, well, you know what a, what a breakup is. So it's writing, from, it's writing from those emotions that come out of a breakup. One quick thing I do want to say um, about writing what you know is that when you're sort of dealing with emotions, one really important thing to remember is that the road from action to reaction is never linear. So if you sort of study emotion and you study, let's say you're working with stress, for example, um, and how that affects a person or a character, um, you want to think about, let's take an example as you have a job, right, and you're really stressed out at work. Um, your boss is giving you hell. Well, you can't yell at your boss, right, because you're going to get fired. So what do we do? It's socially accepted that we take it, right? We take our boss yelling at us. We take that stress. We carry it down. And then maybe later at home, when we're around our friends or our family or our children, where we feel comfortable, that stress comes out. It seeps out. And it may not be directly, but we may start to snap at our kids, right, when they're, when they're annoying us, where normally our patients would be up here, now it's down here. That's sort of, you know, to understand that stress in one situation doesn't always come out right away and will come out differently to different people in another situation is really important to dealing with the emotions that are at work in your story. One exercise that I think is really helpful for writers to figure out whether or not you're doing this and how you can improve is if you were to take two of your favorite short stories, one that you've written and one that you've read by your favorite author, and reread them and write a one-sentence description for each for what actually happened in the story. That's what literally happened, the literal events of the story. And the second description is what you think was going on underneath the surface of the story. Um, because you're going to find that although a story may be um, on the surface about a guy who's hanging out at a bar and talking to people that he meets, what it's actually about is him dealing with loss or, you know, or self-acceptance. Um, and so you want to think about how these undertones of the story come out through the story. Are, where are they subtle? Where are they obvious? How do they change the mood of the story? Um, one example that I think is really helpful is I'm not sure that anybody is familiar with David Gates. Um, he's a great writer. He's a really kind of dark, moody writer. Um, a lot of his stories, surface level, are about a guy who's an older guy who's screwed up in life. He's screwed up his relationships. Um, maybe now it's 
however many years later after a relationship has ended, he's alone in a cabin, he goes out to a bar, he meets people, right? That's what literally happens in the story. But if you start to think about the undertones of the story and what the story is actually about, it seems to be about a guy who's sort of um, trying to figure himself out and working through a sense of self-acceptance um, and sort of forgiveness for himself and these and these things that he's done and sort of come to terms with the way that he's screwed up his relationship and in a sense his life. Um, and so it's about it's really a story about acceptance more than anything else. Um, and if you start to do that for a couple of stories, you'll realize the ways, and you can almost pinpoint the ways that all those subtle undertones come out in the surface level of the story. And that's why we love them, right? That's why we can read them and connect to them. You know, it's not actually a story line by line about this guy, you know, trying to accept himself, which we're all doing, right? No, you, but you can... You can see, once you know that that's what the story is about, you can see in, in all the spaces that, that it is. I'd like to get into my second point, which is my favorite point, which is building characters. And it's my favorite point because a lot of writers that I work with, um, believe it or not, don't go the full length to building up their characters. So what happens is that they end up having these sort of like flat, one-dimensional characters. And so I wanna show you today how to completely avoid that. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of Hemingway's old iceberg theory, uh, which is basically that there's 80% of the character is, is like what's going on underneath the surface. These are things that only you as the writer knows and the reader sees the top 20%. So how do you do that? How do you make sort of this full realistic character, um, come through the story without, uh, giving the reader every possible detail that you ever thought about of the character. Well, you create what I love to call a character Bible. And a character Bible is the sort of list of seemingly unrelated information about each character that appears in your story, um, right down to the waitress who's sort of just like passing through. Um, and you have to, of course, think about how in-depth you go is sort of based on what role they play in your story. Um, but it's a question that sort of answers the history about the characters. It answers uh, things about their goals in life. Um, if you're writing a short story about a breakup, um, you want to answer the questions for the history of the character that are surrounding uh, breakup, loss, um, what that looks like for the character, when they experienced it. Um, you want to have things about your characters, not only where they grew up, but what kind of household did they grow up in? Did their parents get along? Did they fight with their siblings? Are they an only child? What does that mean? What does that look like? How does that play out for them? Um, what are their struggles? You know, those sorts of larger things. But then you want to get into something that's called the lumpy parts, which I think are the best uh, character attributes that you could possibly spend time on. And these are weird things, too. They're... Um, there are things like, um, you know, is the character in mismatched socks? Um, does the character have glasses? Um, does the character constantly interrupt others? Um, do they squint when they're confused? Um, what about, you know, the lines on their face? You know, when they're confused, do their, their brows furrow and they have that sort of deep line on their forehead? Um, you want to think about all of these things um, and the way they talk, um, their tics and language. You know, are they really repetitive? Um, when they're, you know, do they keep using a certain phrase over and over again? You want to know all those things. And you may be thinking, well, why does it matter if my character is in mismatched socks, right? That has nothing to do with the story or who they are. Well, it matters because when you have um, a section of dialogue, it's pretty boring for a reader to just read, he said, she said, he said, she said, he said, she said. Right? It'd be much more interesting if you layered between the he said, she says that when a character is speaking, he bends down to scratch a bug bite on his calf, and the other character notices that not only is he in mismatched socks, but that one's an ankle sock and one's a tube sock. Okay, not only does that layer the actual he said, she said, but it tells you something about your character. Um, that character is not really interested in um, wearing the same kinds of socks. Uh, they don't really notice that. Maybe they're not really that attentive to detail. Um, and those things, if you sort of build all those sorts of um, details up about your character, 
when piled on top of each other, um, the readers, you know, they're going to come through to create a fuller character. Um, two things also that I think you can sort of only get to through a character bible um, are gesture and dialogue. Um, character bible, same thing with gesture. You know, how does a character speak? Like me, do they use their hands a lot? Um, what sort of, how can you use body language to convey um, what they're saying, how they're feeling, you know, are they relaxed and, you know, leaning against the wall with their, with their leg up and a hand in their pocket, or are they really tense and, you know, their, their body is uptight. All of those things, if you know your character really well and the situations that he's in, you're going to be able to use gesture to elaborate on your character and sort of layer your character. Um, and that sort of uh, feeds kind of nicely into dialogue. Um, because you also have to know these sort of quirks of your character so that you can incorporate them into dialogue. Um, you know, one thing that I think is really important when it comes to building characters is to be aware of the way that people um, speak to each other. Um, I, you know, I urge you to go in and eavesdrop in on a conversation between two, two people anywhere. Um, and you'll very quickly notice the way that people talk to each other. So they talk in snippets, um, they heavily use pronouns, um, they are talking about two different things at one time, um, and they're sort of talking around each other and at each other. They're never directly talking to each other. Um, you know, if you take an example of uh, a guy comes home, he's from grocery shopping, he's in the kitchen, and he's, you know, putting away the groceries, and his wife is in the other room, and she's watching TV, and the guy is saying, Oh, I, you know, I've got the bananas. Oh, were they on sale? Yes. Okay. Oh, did you get the peanut butter? Okay. Yes. Did you get crunchy or smooth? Right. Um, oh, I ran into, you know, so-and-so at the, at the supermarket. And then you have like, you know, a page of all the dialogue that he says he totally recounts his conversation of who he ran into at the supermarket. Well, that's not really how it happened. If he ran into someone that it's worth putting in the story, his wife is going to interrupt him and say, Oh, I saw, you know, so-and-so the other day, or I can't believe she said that, or, oh, um, come, look look at this commercial. This is my favorite commercial. This is the one that I've been talking about for days. And now suddenly the conversation goes from this, like, linear conversation of this guy's replaying of his events in the supermarket, and it's interjected with what's going on on the TV and in conversations. And then they go back to the conversation about who they met in the supermarket. And then the conversation is sort of layered, and that's realistic. Whereas if it was just straight, I say something and, you know, another character responds directly, like, that's not at all how people talk. Um, so you want to really stay true to how people actually talk and you want to put those things um, in your characters because it's going to be a lot more interesting for your readers. Um, somebody asked earlier, how long should a short story be? Um, you basically have up to 20,000 words to tell a reader everything they need to know about your character, why he's there, what he's doing, what his challenges are, and why we should care. Um, so what this means is that as the writer, it's really important for you to learn what's, what sort of information is important and what is less important in, in your story. Um, this takes a little bit of skill, but more than any, more than anything, it really takes an honest detachment from your writing. Um, you know, it means not being attached to a really poetic line that you had, um, or, you know, one really interesting section, um, to a short story. Um, it sort of is about looking at the short story as a whole, what you're trying to convey and what really works and serves the story. Um, if you sort of break it down, every single sentence in your short story should do one of two things. It should either um, advance the plot or reveal character. If it doesn't do one of those th two things, it's got to go. Um, the word count for short stories, I said it before, I'll just uh, say it again. Um, it is anywhere usually between 2,000 and 20,000 words. Um, so you don't have a lot of space to convey your story and tell the reader, basically give the reader reason to care. A couple of things with editing. Um, first is that you want to start a story as close to the end as possible. 
a story is not like a novel. You don't have 100,000 words to go into backstory, um, details, side stories, histories. You don't have any of that. Um, if you spend too much time as a writer sort of leading up to the main event of your story, by that time, the reader will have closed the book and is off doing something else. So you've got to figure out what the core of your story is about and start as close to the end as possible. And anything that comes before any of that sort of lead up has got to go because it's not going to serve the short story. And then another really important point of editing is to trust the reader. Please trust the reader. Um, we can read between the lines. Um, and we have a good memory. You know, short stories, you have to remember, are usually read in one sitting. So um, the, the, the reader is going to be able to guess sort of things that have happened, um, and they're going to remember things that happened. Um, and we don't need every detail told to us. This is not that kind of novel. Um, so to give you an example, it's one of my favorite examples. I made it up, but I think it really works, is the story of Jimmy's girlfriend. Um, if you have a, if you have two friends who get into a fist fight, um, the way that you don't want to do the story is uh, Jimmy finds out somebody slept with his girlfriend, right? His friend slept with his girlfriend, and he's mad. Um, you know, he grabs his keys. He, you know, he runs to his car. He opens the car door. He gets in the car, closes the car door, puts the key in the ignition, turns it on pulls out of his driveway, he's driving to the bar, he's mad, he's gripping the steering wheel, his knuckles are all white, he pulls up to the, the bar, he, he takes the key out of the ignition, right, can't leave it running, he opens the car door, he gets out of the car, he slams the car door, he walks up to the bar, the gravel's, you know, crunching underneath his boots, he swings open the, the bar door and he says, I heard you slept with my girlfriend Jenny, is this true? Not at all how you want to do a short story, and you know I've I've seen it I've seen things like that more times than I can count. Um, here's why: one, the reader knows, and uh, and the characters in the story know damn well who Jenny is, right? They both slept with her. They know who she is. We don't need the sort of um, the reminder that she's so and so's girlfriend. Second thing: language is totally unnatural. Um, you don't need someone to say, uh, is the, you know, you slept with my, my girlfriend. Is this true? That's not how people would talk. Third of all, all of the details to get Jimmy from his home to the bar are totally unnecessary. Um, we can imagine he probably drove. He probably didn't fly. Um, if he did, that would appear elsewhere in the story, that it would be some sort of futuristic, otherworldly um, setting. Um, so you don't need to put in sort of all those details. The reader can understand that, you know, all of the events, the way, the way the car door opened and closes, you know, we know how a car works, right? The real way to do that story is to start off with Jimmy swinging the bar door open and said, did you, did you screw Jenny, right? That's what you really want. And then to immediately go into not even waiting for an answer, the sound that his fist makes as it's as it reaches his friend's nose, the sound of the cracking of the nose, then go into talking about the temperature of the blood as it's rushing down from the nose to the mouth, and then the salty metal taste of the blood. That's a story that I'm going to keep reading because that's a story that dives right into the action. Um, so you really want to make sure that you're not stating any obvious information for your readers, um, and you want to make sure that you're using natural language, and natural language will come if you've built a um, character Bible, which you know we spoke about a little bit before. A couple other points about editing, which I think are really important, is you don't want to be repetitive. So that means sort of analyzing every sentence um, that you come across. And if there are two sentences in a row that are saying the exact same thing, but using different words to do it, one of them's got to go. And I would recommend uh, mostly um, keeping the simpler one. It'll serve your story better, trust me. Um, another thing is show, don't tell. The old rule applies. Um, any, any point in your story uh, where you have someone sort of scowling or, you know, giving a look um, or, you know, so-and-so said in a mad way, um, 
don't do any of that. Don't let language do the work for you. It's lazy narrative. Um, be just be really descriptive um, in your elements when the show don't tell. Um, so if somebody's angry, um, talk about. Don't say they said this angrily or they yelled. Right. Well, what else accompanies yelling when you're angry? You know, usually your your brows furrow when you get that deep line. And if you're normally a very angry person, you do that all the time, or if that's your sort of go-to facial expression, then your line's going to be really deep, right? Um, or, you know, sort of talking about, like I mentioned earlier, if a character's really relaxed, like have him leaning against the wall with his leg up. Um, use that. Don't say that he said it in a relaxed tone or that he was feeling really relaxed. Um, wherever you sort of let the language do the work for you, you want to circle those points in your story and you want to see how you can replace them. And again, this too goes back to the character Bible. Um, because if you've done sort of your, um, your laying out of your character features, you can just pluck them from your Bible and pop them right in where they're appropriate. Um, and then the last sort of thing is that uh, you don't let your dialogue tags do the work. It sort of relates to um, lazy narrative. It's hardly ever appropriate to use anything more complicated than he said, she said, or he asked, she asked. Um, anytime you find yourself doing that, see how else you can say that, how else you can convey that information. Um, and you'll have a, a lot stronger of a, of a descriptive like element for your character. Um, I'd like to move on to the last point of short stories after you've sort of created your short story, um, it's really emotionally true to you. Uh, you've built up your characters. They're really full and complex and multifaceted. Um, and you've edited down your work. Um, so you have sort of the essence of your short story. Congratulations. Now you have a full, complete short story that's ready to be sent out to publishers. What do you do with it? Um, two kinds of literary magazines. Um, I have experience in both, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what each means. Um, there's online literary magazines and there's print literary magazines. One is not better than the other. Um, it sort of depends what you're looking for in terms of your career as a writer. A lot of writers that I work with that are self-publishing um, and their, their books are appearing on um, Kindle and Amazon, those writers, they have more of an online focus, and so they want to write short stories and they want to get them into online publications um, because that's where their audience is. Um, for other writers maybe who are going through the traditional road of publishing, maybe they want to get their um, names into print magazines um, for launching their writing career. Um, it's not one or the other. It's, you know, you can do a, bent, a blend of both, and definitely there are good and bad things about both. Um, I've worked with writers personally who have um, launched their writing career from a single short story um, because agents do read literary magazines, um, and there are fewer literary magazines, and so there's more agent eyes sort of on print literary magazines um, than online ones. But... There are really good online print magazines um, as well. I do want to talk for a minute about the reputation of print magazines because I think that's something that's really important to writers. Um, print magazines have a reputation of being the place for serious writing. And the reason that that is, and I never realized that until I started publishing literary magazines myself, it's because there are so many restrictions in creating a print magazine. Um, in terms of budget, in terms of space, and in terms of theme. So depending on the print magazine, you know, most of them publish, you know, anywhere from one to four times a year. And um, some of them are different. They do publish more frequently. But generally, there's a certain amount of, of time, um, times that a magazine comes out each year. There's a certain budget for the magazine that sets that their budget for paying writers. That's their printing costs. Um, and that's their shipping costs. That number doesn't change, right? Um, maybe they make a little more money, great, and they gotta pay a staff too, um, and then their budget increases slightly, right? But there's a set budget for every issue, and there's also a set amount of space. Um, so when a short story makes it into a print magazine, the reason that it's considered more serious writing is because print magazines are much more selective because they have to be. Um, they just don't have the budget or the space, literally, to publish every short story that they come across. Um, whereas online magazines, um, you know, they may publish once a week, 
Um, but every, you know, if, if they find that they're getting more work that they really like, well, then they, they can easily say, hey, this week we're doing a bonus and we have two short stories every week this month. Um, there's less restriction with that. The only sort of restriction is if they pay, um, that their budget for writers has to increase a little bit. Um, so that's why print is sort of take understood as the place for more serious writing. It's literally comes down to budget and space. Um, and that's sort of an important thing I think to, to, to realize um, if you're a writer. So if you've been writing to um, print magazines and you haven't been published yet, it's not necessarily a reflection on your writing. It literally might just be time and theme for the magazine um, and that your story like just didn't make the cut. Uh, so definitely don't give up and don't feel discouraged even though I know rejection letters can feel like the worst, um, but pile them up, save them, you know, Put them away and you can laugh at them one day when you actually are published in those magazines and you have a successful writing career. It does take a long time, so you got to definitely keep trying. Just a note on sort of where to find literary magazines and what's right for you. There are a couple of really good directories. Uh, some that I can think of off the top of my head are uh, Duotropes, which I think is still around, um, Poets and Writers, and New Pages. Um, all of these websites will um, list a breakdown of literary magazines who's publishing what, whether or not they pay, and how much they pay, um, how often their magazines come out. It gives you a direct link to their submission page, which is super helpful. Um, and it sort of talks about their genre and what sort of things they're looking for. Uh, so if, you're, if you've got some short stories that are ready to go, you definitely want to check out those websites and see what's you know, most appropriate for you um, and where you want to submit. And just a quick note on the submission format, uh, keep it simple, keep it clean. Don't try and seek out the editor's um, personal email. Um, I know it seems like you'll be getting ahead of the game, but you won't. Um, so just follow the submission process and follow the submission guidelines. And if you've been published in you know, 50 other journals, uh, that's super, but just list your top three. Because um, a long list of like where you've been published is, you know, it's. It doesn't really make a difference on your short story. I mean, many times I, when I was publishing and editing work for a literary magazine, um, I never read the uh, submission letter until after I read the story because I didn't want to sort of be tainted by where that person was previously published. Um, and, it, you know, if it's magazines that I had heard of or, you know, or not heard of or, you know, whether or not they had been published before, I don't think that's fair. Um, I think that, you know, each story, each individual story should be given a chance. Um, all right. Well, I think that's about it. Uh, I really want to thank you all for joining me today. I really hope that the information that I gave you was helpful. If you um, found it helpful and you're looking for uh, more in-depth information, um, on short story writing from sort of beginning to end, uh, I would suggest that you sign up for my Readsy learning course called How to Craft a Killer Short Story. Um, and if you guys have any short stories that you're looking for an editor on, I love short stories. I'm more than happy to uh, talk to you about them and to help you edit them, um, or if you have a novel that you're working on as well. Thank you all so much for taking the time to um, talk with me today and to listen to my tips and I really hope that you found the information helpful. So, good night.